Good evening. Come on down and welcome to the Walrus Talks Economic Reconciliation presented by Enbridge. I'm Jennifer Hollett. I am the Executive Director of the Walrus. I am also your host for this evening. We are thrilled to be back here in Ottawa, in person and online at the National Gallery of Canada. Hello to the over 400 households who have signed up and are joining us on the live stream. We encourage you, whether you're in person or at home, to continue the conversation with us on social media. It's a nice way to connect both audiences together. So the hashtag tonight is hashtag Walrus Talks. And we also encourage you to tag us on any of the social media platforms at the Walrus. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional, unceded Anishinaabe Algonquin territory in Canada's capital city. Ottawa is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. And at the Walrus, we're really honored to carry on a tradition of storytelling. We encourage all of you to reflect on the land you're on, wherever you're joining us from today. This year, the Walrus turns 20, and that's either really old or really young, <laughs> depending on who you are and where we stand. But lots to celebrate for us as a nonprofit working in this media landscape. And to celebrate, we're taking a look at who we are now. Find our stories wherever you can, whether that's online, we're at thewalrus.ca, in print on newsstands, or by subscribing to The Walrus. You can also listen to our podcasts and be a part of our events like this one. And this work is powered by our donors, our supporters, and our partners. So thank you for being here and being a part of this event this evening, and to Enbridge for partnering with us. To kick things off, please welcome to the stage Colin Grunding, Executive Vice President and President of Liquids Pipelines at Enbridge. Thanks, Jen. My name is Colin Grunding. I, I work at Enbridge. I run our liquids pipelines business, crude oil pipeline. Uh, we have some other businesses you might know of. We have a renewables business that's quite large. We have a, a gas pipeline business, and we have a natural gas distribution business. Many of you in Ottawa would be, would be customers, and we thank you for your business. On behalf of Enbridge, it's my pleasure to host you this evening and also briefly share our journey uh, regarding Indigenous reconciliation. This is something we're very passionate about and we feel it's an important conversation to have and that's why we brought together this expert panel to provide their insights. Uh, but first briefly let me set the table from, from our perspective. Uh, we, we've been on a, a journey of reconciliation for, for some time, many years, many decades in fact, uh, across a variety of jurisdictions in North America. Um, we haven't always got it right, okay? Um, but we've, we've tried different things, we've, we've matured, we've invested in it, we've learned from, from our mistakes uh, through consultation, uh, indigenous contractor procurement, uh, direct employment, and more recently, uh, we've, we've attempted uh, f full on uh, indigenous co-investment alongside Enbridge, um, and uh, I'll speak to that briefly. We, we, uh, we also have, have rolled out uh, a number of months ago our first Indigenous Reconciliation Action Plan, or IRAP. It's, it's one of the first in the industry and one of the first in Canada, and it sets out 22 commitments that, that we've made around in Indigenous reconciliation, of which co-investment is one of them. And so we, uh, we actioned one of them last year, and I think the panel will, will speak to a bit of it. Um, we began in our own backyard in northern Alberta, uh, reaching out to Indigenous partners whom we've been working with for, for many years, decades really. And I'd say it took courage for, for both sides to uh, attempt this together. Uh, a bit of a leap of faith, I would even say. Uh, would it work? Is, is this, uh, you know, what, what's in this for me? Uh, a number of other questions that I'm sure uh, Justin and others can speak to. Um, importantly, it also took a breakthrough innovative funding program out of the Alberta government, which uh, I'm sure Peter will, will mention. 
and some other X factors in, in, the, in the transaction that our panelists may speak to as well. Um, I won't get into a lot of the details of it. Um, it's it's uh, ballpark uh, $1.1 billion investment by 23 First Nations in Northern Alberta in seven pipelines, which will have long live cash flows. Um, and, and for Enbridge, we also benefit. We, we've gained a full-on equity partner uh, with knowledge of the land, water, and environmental stewardship practices, which we hold dear. But I want to be clear that Enbridge does not presume to speak on behalf of other companies here. Um, we think it is the way of the future, the next logical step towards advancing reconciliation in an actionable and enduring way. That also happens to build out the infrastructure that society needs, and there's been a lot of discussion on, on, on that. I won't get into that today, but um, we hope our example inspires, inspires other companies to see the value in fostering Indigenous economic partnerships and co-investment. In fact, with respect to scope, we see it as critical to delivering future world-class projects in sectors such as crude oil, natural gas, LNG, carbon pipelines, hydrogen pipelines, hydrogen blending facilities, solar, and wind. It's an all of the above opportunity set here. And we intend to replicate this, this strategy and practice and and uh, community uh, partnering across our portfolio in Canada and the United States across all the four businesses I mentioned earlier. So um, I hope that tonight's event will get you thinking, uh, those in the room and those online, thinking about this as a potential catalyst for change, a uh, catalyst for more discussion, and ideally inspire action on further economic participation specifically. So let's hear from our uh, experts next. Thank you all for attending, and I look forward to uh, furthering this conversation and the reception. Thank you. Back to you, John. Thank you, Colin. Tonight, we are taking a look at economic reconciliation, or as the opening video highlighted, reconciliation. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 90-second call to action says, we call upon the corporate sector in Canada to adopt the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a reconciliation framework and to apply its principles, norms, and standards to corporate policy and core operational activities involving Indigenous peoples and their lands and resources. We're beginning to see this work happening in practice, and tonight we'll see it in the energy sector. You'll hear from seven speakers who are doing this work and learn about some of the opportunities available to truly further economic reconciliation. If you're new to the Walrus Talks, here's how it works. Seven speakers, seven minutes each, seven different perspectives. And these talks are back to back, and then we'll continue the conversation with a reception for those in Ottawa. Tonight, we'll be hearing from Justin Bork, President Athabasca Indigenous Investments. Dr. Monica Gattinger, Founding Chair, Positive Energy, University of Ottawa. Natalie Kaufelt, Senior Director, Horizontal Policy, Natural Resources, Canada. Trevor Gardner, Co-Head, Canadian Investment Banking, RBC Capital Markets. Tabitha Bull, President and CEO, Canada Council for Aboriginal Business. Peter Williams, Founding Board Member and Chair of the Investment Committee, Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation. Managing Partner and CEO, Annapolis Capital Limited. And Chief Charlene Gale, Chief Fort Nelson First Nation and Chair, First Nations Major Projects Coalition. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello, and Tanse. My name is Justin Bork, 
and I am the president of the Athabasca Indigenous Investments. I'm excited to set the stage here for you tonight as my fellow speakers and I share our perspectives on how public and private sectors can and should support economic reconciliation and what role they might play in creating a space for Indigenous development that can lead to economic sovereignty. One important topic as of late has been equity ownership in resource development. I have been fortunate to have experience in executing two major equity ownership transactions for Indigenous communities. In 2020, 2021, Suncor, along with three First Nations and five Métis communities, formed a partnership called ASDISI in the acquisition of the Northern Courier Pipeline System. And just six short months ago, in October of 2022, Enbridge and 23 diverse Indigenous communities, including the Cree, Diné, and Métis people of Northeast Alberta, partnered in what's being called a historic and precedent-setting event. The acquisition of seven pipelines which serve as the arteries to the oil sands and carries critical energy infrastructure from our shared ter traditional territories to the global markets. Our consortium discussed the benefits of our partnership would have. Benefits not just for the people of today, but for future generations. The concept of seven pipelines for seven generations was discussed at great length with community leaders, elders, and soon became the theme of our transaction. It excites me to see these transactions close and the community's plans start to take shape. I am humbled to be privy of the aging strategies that the shareholder communities of the Athabasca Indigenous Investments are putting into action with their dividends. Hiring of school teachers to develop the youth, improve the standard of living for the elders, buying of land, and building critical, critical infrastructure are just a few of the plans that are already in motion, while other communities are looking to increase their investment opportunities and position their community not just to be owners, asset owners in resource development, but to be influential in it. In my experience, the benefits that equity ownership provides is empowering to Indigenous people, and it provides the Indigenous leaders the capacity to enhance their community's way of life. The reality, though, is these benefits are not just specific to the Indigenous participants. Indigenous ownership and resource development brings revenues once destined for investors and injects them into the Indigenous communities, which then ripples into the neighboring towns and cities, strengthening our local economies and decoupling reliance by building resilience instead. There is no one and only pathway to recon economic reconciliation, but equity ownership is proving to be an effective option across all sectors with, la with lasting benefits for us all. We are seeing more examples of these good news stories every day. Indigenous-led organizations and allyships created with partnership in mind. Just the other week, it was announced that Cedar LNG received an environmental approval. And with the green light on that project, Cedar LNG aims to be the first Indigenous majority-owned LNG facility. And yet another example of how Indigenous ownership can be structured to provide local benefit while playing a role in the global security. Frankly, the opportunity for economic reconciliation is more than just inclusion in energy and resource development. It's a mechanism to inclusively respond to the climate crisis we are currently navigating. As government and corporate communities adjust to the mandated reporting requirements of the environmental, social, and corporate governance, or ESG, practices that are now at the forefront of business considerations across the globe, a paradigm shift in how we view and do business is taking place. Driving corporations to think, act, operate, and conduct business differently and the word sustainability is at the center of it all. It's important to recognize that this new focus for business has always been the traditional views and values of Indigenous peoples. With this new common alignment and values sets the foundation for long-lasting partnerships to flourish. This alignment is fundamental for Indigenous communities to become vested partners in providing a collective path forward and with it, we can increase the corporate response time to the climate crisis. Indigenous partnerships will continue to emerge in new and existing markets, from emission reduction technologies to low carbon fuels, biodiversity and environmental enhancements, renewable energy, 
and carbon capture and sequestration projects like the Wobbleman Carbon Hub, the partnership between Enbridge and five Indigenous communities, or the Cedar LNG, as mentioned earlier, which has the potential to reduce global emissions by reducing the global demand on coal. Participation in these markets will enhance Indigenous economic sovereignty, increase project certainty, and strengthen our economies while collectively taking action in the fight against climate. This creates a value chain of benefit for Indigenous communities, their corporate partners, Canadians, governments, and the world. It positions Canada as global leaders in ESG and having a direct ability to influence the global emissions by providing our morally developed resources, both locally and to our international allies, while enhancing the way of life for Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike. In the end, reconciliation is about righting the injustices of the past, while embarking on a common journey into the future. Economic reconciliation through equity ownership is a critical component of that future, and if done right, we can ensure economic sovereignty of the Indigenous peoples for generations to come, while Canada leaves the world into a net zero future. Thank you. Kinnanastamotan. Good evening, everyone. My name is Monica Gattinger. I'm a professor at the University of Ottawa. I've been a student of energy policy and regulation for almost three decades. It pains me to say that. I am not Indigenous, and the perspective I share with you this evening is my own. It's based upon my research, knowledge, and experience. For the last 10 years, through a research and engagement program called Positive Energy, I've worked very closely with leaders in the energy sector from business, government, Indigenous organizations, and academia to identify how to strengthen public confidence in energy and climate decision making. One of the most exciting developments over that time, and in particular in the last five years, is the remarkable strides being made towards economic reconciliation through major energy projects. But before getting to my thoughts, I'd like to ask you to reflect on your own knowledge and experience with economic reconciliation. When you think about big energy projects and Indigenous communities, what comes to mind? Is it conflict between Indigenous peoples and companies? Is it projects that don't reflect Indigenous peoples' values, perspectives, and worldviews? Is it governments that approve major projects despite the opposition of Indigenous communities? Is it protests, demonstrations, and altercations between Indigenous people and police? Is it legal challenges brought by Indigenous groups opposing projects in the courts? In my conversations with people outside of the energy sector, my friends, my family, people at the dog park, people at the shopping mall, these images tend to be the dominant view but there's a whole other world of economic activity in the energy sector. The emergence of more and more constructive relationships between Indigenous communities, companies, and governments. Now, I'm not here to say that all is sweetness and light. There's still much work to be done on economic reconciliation. But developments in the last few years are remarkable, they're inspiring, and they give me great hope for the future. First, Increasingly, we're seeing communities enter into unprecedented partnerships with industry to develop energy projects of all types. Companies are working in new and innovative ways with Indigenous communities to co-design projects and ensure that projects respect community values, community interests, environmental protection, sustainable economic development opportunities, and revenue streams for communities, respect for tradition, culture, and language. Importantly, these partnerships are increasingly equity partnerships, where Indigenous communities have an ownership stake in the project. The examples abound, everything from pipelines 
to electricity transmission lines, to battery storage projects, and on and on. Second, increasingly we're seeing indigenous communities lead the design, development, and ownership of projects, paving the way to a new generation of indigenous-owned infrastructure. This has already been the case for some time in solar and in wind, but it's extending increasingly to other energy sources as well. The Heisla Nation's Cedar LNG facility on BC's west coast is but the most recent example. Valued at $3 billion, it's the largest First Nation energy-owned project in Canada so far. Third, Indigenous communities are increasingly setting their own standards for environmental protection and the assessment of tolerable impacts of projects on their territory's land, air, water, and ways of life. The emergence of indigenous standards operating alongside federal and provincial government standards is a little known but remarkable, uh, remarkably important transformation. Articulating what's important to a community in its own terms when it comes to project impacts. Finally, increasingly we're seeing indigenous communities assume the role of regulator, evaluating projects proposed in their territories using their own standards, processes, traditional knowledge, and worldviews. They're putting in place frameworks to decide whether a project should or shouldn't be allowed to proceed and under what conditions. Smart companies are getting with the program. All of these developments are important steps in the process of economic reconciliation. They are tangible expressions of what it truly means for a, company to consent, for a community to consent to a project. The growing spirit of collaboration that I see between indigenous communities, companies, and governments has more and more momentum. But there's much more work to be done. To participate in projects with equity positions, indigenous communities need access to capital. Access to loans and loan guarantees from governments are an important place to start. Banks and other parts of the investment community will also need to step up, developing new business models and financing approaches for projects. Some of this is already happening. And energy companies still have a long ways to go. Increasingly, they understand that the best path to an energy project ending up in service, not in court, is taking the time to build respectful relationships and meaningful business partnerships with Indigenous communities. But we need greater awareness, understanding, and action across corporate Canada. Governments also need to change how they do things. There's work to do to identify how Indigenous-led impact assessments and Indigenous regulatory processes work alongside federal and provincial standards and regulation. Instead of duplicating processes, are there opportunities for federal and provincial governments to defer to Indigenous processes or to harmonize with them? For that to happen, governments need to be prepared to cede some control, something that they may find very difficult to do. But it may be one of the most important steps that they can take in the process of economic reconciliation. Let us not forget that many major projects needed for Canada to pursue its energy and climate goals will be situated on or travel across Indigenous territories. Geothermal, carbon capture utilization and storage, hydropower, electricity transmission lines, liquefied natural gas, wind and solar energy, and on and on. I can't think of a more exciting time to roll up our sleeves. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Natalie Caulfield and I'm here tonight to represent Natural Resources Canada, a federal department at the forefront of the government of Canada's economic reconciliation agenda. I'm thrilled to be here tonight, both in my capacity as a dedicated and very jubilant public servant, as well as a proud indigenous woman from the Algonquins of Pikwaknagan First Nation to speak about this very important topic with this very impressive lineup. This may come as a shock, but as the federal government, we are not always the quickest to move, and we can at times be risk averse. But when it comes to economic reconciliation and making progress on concrete outcomes, this is a policy space receiving a ton of attention right now, and for very good reason. 
we are seeing demand for many of Canada's natural resources continue to grow exponentially. Think LNG, critical minerals, hydrogen, clean technology, forestry, and so on. But as we work to establish Canada as a global leader in these sectors, the stakes for respectful relationships with Indigenous peoples, communities, and businesses has never been higher. Against the backdrop of the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, we are taking cues from Indigenous-led calls to action to define what it takes to achieve economic reconciliation and natural resources. Likewise, Canadian industry has really raised the bar for meaningful partnerships and engagement with Indigenous communities on projects. There is a willingness to engage communities early and throughout the life cycle of projects to offer jobs and other financial benefits dedicated directly to communities and even to provide equity for communities to purchase stakes in projects. And now it is our turn, as the Government of Canada, to step up and play a bigger role in this space. We can't be serious about our commitment to advance reconciliation with Indigenous partners until we take action to ensure that natural resources sectors, which is the largest private employer of Indigenous peoples in Canada, provide long-term prosperity, energy security, and economic benefits. So with this in mind, and to answer the question of tonight's theme, how can the government support a brighter economic future for Indigenous peoples in Canada, I want to provide just a few of our lessons learned, which are now shaping how we work moving forward. First, we have learned that priority setting does not take place in a vacuum or in silos. A sustainable natural resources development future can only be achieved when we align our priorities with the vision set by Indigenous peoples and work in lockstep. For example, through the regional energy and resource tables, we are directly engaging communities across Canada to understand their energy goals and are designing place-based action plans to make sure that these goals become a reality. Second, we are moving away from a, a prescriptive approach to working with Indigenous communities and change the relationship dynamic from one of funder-recipient to one of partner-to-partner. -partner. And it is through this kind of Indigenous-led approach that we can build long-term, sustained, and iterative relationships that allow us to support Indigenous groups in defining what energy sovereignty and economic prosperity means to them. In another example, through the Indigenous Natural Resources Partnerships Program, which are on the surface looks like a run-of-the-mill funding program, we are providing capacity to support Indigenous communities, organizations, and businesses to unlock a wide array of innovative economic opportunities and natural resources, including, for example, the development of Indigenous decision-making frameworks regarding equity investments and natural resources, business capacity support to explore equity ownership in major projects, Indigenous-centered critical minerals literacy training, and the implementation of Indigenous-led climate action plans that work in to position Indigenous communities and organizations as leaders in a decarbonized economy. And finally, we are moving into a new era where Indigenous peoples, communities, and businesses have seats at the table as meaningful participants, decision makers, and in some cases, owners, in all stages of a project's development. In recognition of this, we have been asked to develop a national benefit sharing framework to ensure that communities benefit more consistently and equitably from natural resource development in their territories. This work focuses on closing capacity gaps, investing in skills and training, and increasing access to affordable capital. In my personal experience, as an Indigenous person who grew up in community not too far from where we are tonight, being a public servant can sometimes be a bit of a surreal and confusing experience. I often find myself questioning whether my work is truly serving the best interests of my community and so many others like it across Canada but I know that we do have a monumental opportunity to make real transformational change. That is truly what makes me excited for the work in front of my team. I think of the many topics that have and will be discussed tonight, from supporting equity ownerships and projects, to advancing self-determination, to the achievement of community-led energy sovereignty, and I recognize how privileged I am to have this role in contributing to advancing progress. Chi miigwech, thank you.
Good evening, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm truly excited and honored to be here uh, as part of this uh, terrific panel this evening, and particularly to be speaking about this topic, which is really important to me and to many of my colleagues at RBC. My name is Trevor Gardner. I'm co-head of investment banking at RBC Capital Markets. Um, as I start, I think it's important to acknowledge what expertise I bring and what expertise I don't bring. Uh, during my time at the bank, I've had the privilege of working with some of Canada's largest companies, with governments, with executives, with boards, on all kinds of projects across all kinds of financial markets. I've also had the experience in living in different parts of Canada, growing up on a farm in Saskatchewan, building a career in Calgary and Toronto. That being said, I don't have the lived experience that many on the panel do, and candidly, in the last couple hours, I've learned a lot and look forward to learning a lot more tonight. I do want to focus tonight on providing what's hopefully a unique and impactful perspective on the topic, given RBC's presence uh, in all financial markets of Canada. So in preparing for today, a question I got was, what role does a bank play in economic reconciliation? I think that's an important question, so I'll give it a shot. I'm proud to start by highlighting that RBC's central purpose is helping clients thrive, and communities prosper. As part of this purpose, for over 25 years, RBC's been committed to our own reconciliation journey. Similar to Colin at Enbridge, uh, we haven't always got it right, but it's important to, uh, to acknowledge that it's something we've been very focused on for a long period of time. When the findings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission were made public in 2015, we undertook ways to honor the calls to action, specifically Call to Action 92. But I'm here today not to talk about what we have done, but what we are doing, and hopefully what we're able to do uh, in partnership with Indigenous communities and many of our clients in different sectors. We truly have both the ability and the obligation to act in meaningful and important ways on this topic. Similar to what Colin said, while they may put it in different words, I can tell you this perspective sits not only at RBC, but at other banks and other large companies uh, in Canada. It's become deeply embedded in the thought process in terms of corporate strategy, procurement, and business action. In Canada, reconciliation, including economic rec reconciliation, is clearly one of the most important social issues of our time. So in speaking to my colleagues and our clients, Economic re reconciliation comes to life in three ways. First, acknowledging and understanding the past. Secondly, engaging, truly engaging, with Indigenous communities to understand their objectives today. Third, and most importantly, putting our intellect and our capital into creating true, true economic partnerships for the benefit of communities today, but also for many generations to come. So let's talk about what that means in practice. In our business, we serve millions of customers in Canada, including many Indigenous peoples and communities, and we're very proud of that role. However, the core part of my message today and, and the part of the bank that I work in is not that part. It's dealing with large corporations, with governments, with investors, and increasingly, I'm pleased to say, with Indigenous communities. As you've already heard, um, there was a terrific transaction that Justin and Colin spoke about. RBC was privileged to act as an advisor on that transaction, working with Justin and his team. In addition to the scale and complexity of the financing, what's notable for us is the true economic partnership that was created between a number of Indigenous communities and Enbridge. By purchasing an ownership stake in these pipelines, the communities served are not only advancing their economic prosperity, they're gaining insights into the business, contributing business value, and importantly, a real effort was made to include each one of those diverse communities in the process and will be part of the ownership going forward. From working on it, we know that this transaction was extremely important to the communities involved and also to Enbridge. I can tell you this project was noticed by many in the market. The day it was announced, we were immediately inundated at RBC with questions from investors, from indigenous communities, and corporate clients, 
all interested in how it came together, how it could be applicable to them, and importantly, really trying to understand the opportunities that it might provide in the future. Well, each transaction we've seen, and Monica referenced, there's been many, uh, comes from unique circumstances. There's, there are important common themes. Number one, the capabilities of indigenous communities are quickly increasing and becoming very impressive uh, to, pro to execute these transactions and work alongside corporate partners. Number two, access to capital is strong and growing. Uh, investors have seen the attributes of these transactions, they understand the framework, and they're excited to participate. Number three, successful examples are really powerful. In finance, we're very good at creating new things, but we're even better at replicating and improving things that have already been done. Successful examples like the ones that we've seen are there to be utilized and, uh, and improved upon in the future. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the breadth of opportunities is immense. We've talked a lot about energy and power transactions today, but there's no reason that the, this type of transaction can't occur in different sectors, in all provinces and territories of Canada, in all parts of the economy. What I hope you take away from my comments is that there's a lot of momentum and reason for optimism based on what we've seen recently. However, while this is encouraging, we also know there's a lot more that needs to be done. And as banks, we need to be actively involved in that work. So what are we focused on to ensure that progress remains strong? Helping to advise and share knowledge with indigenous organizations who are still building some of their capabilities. Matching up opportunities with financing that's available. Being innovative and creative to find approaches to finance projects that might not otherwise get done. Listening and appreciating unique perspectives. Each community has different objectives. Each transaction requires different thoughts. And finally, actively removing biases and things that might be misunderstood about these transactions. We've heard the word partnership uh, a number of times today, and that is a really, really important thing to remember and what underpins, in our minds, a successful framework. As you will hopefully take away from my comments, we're excited for the future in, the area, in this area, but we know it will take a lot of hard work, a lot of capital, and a lot of creativity. My fellow speakers and many others are doing some terrific things, and I've truly enjoyed listening and learning from them tonight and look forward to the rest of their comments. I know I speak not only for my colleagues at RBC, but for other banks as well, when I say we look forward to doing our part to keep moving, to, moving ahead towards reconciliation and a more equitable and inclusive future. Thank you. Ani, Buju, Tabitha, Indijnakas, Nipissing, Indijnaba, Majasito Dem. Thank you for acknowledging the land that we're gathering on here today. I myself am a signatory to the Robinson Huron Treaty, so I'm honored to be able to be here in this territory today with all of you. Um, thank you for being here in person and at home, and thank you to Walrus for creating this opportunity. It's an important act to provide space <laughs> for us to gather our thoughts and feelings with intention while keeping our hearts and conversations open about the past and considering the opportunities for the future. And thank you to my fellow speakers for your contributions today. We've talked a lot about reconciliation. For me, it feels a word that we use so often it becomes a bit fragile to say, uh, a little bit fragile on my tongue. Um, you know, with certainty, we know we will not achieve reconciliation without vibrant Indigenous economies, with economic self-sufficiency, prosperity, and social economic equality with the rest of Canada. And we know we cannot begin to speak about reconciliation without first learning the truth. And the truth is that Indigenous people were intentionally excluded from sharing the wealth of this country. We were banned from trade, from selling goods, from hiring lawyers, and no longer considered Indians under the Indian Act if we obtained a post-secondary degree. This exclusion impacted generations. And while these practices are no longer in place, 
rebuilding generational wealth and mentors in our communities will take time, particularly when still today we do not and cannot benefit equally from the resources in our territories. When I speak about economic reconciliation, I am also often asked three common questions. The first, are we seeing progress? Well, we have persisted. Indigenous people are creating businesses at nine times the rate of average non-Indigenous Canadians. There are close to 60,000 Indigenous businesses in Canada, in every sector, size, every province and territory. Additionally, Indigenous businesses are three times more likely to introduce a new product, service, and twice as likely to introduce a new process or a way of doing things. This is particularly true among Indigenous women owners. We see leaders in corporate Canada, like you've heard today, stepping up, building relationships, and as a result benefiting from opportunities in procurement, in partnership, and in investment. More and more, shareholder priorities are shaped by the most pressing issues that companies, investors, and Canadian society face today, including the climate crisis and social equity. Undeniably, reconciliation and relationship with Indigenous peoples is atop that list, and this is fueling progress. Most recently, we've seen public companies pursue economic reconciliation, through proxies to promote responsible investment policies and practices that include reconciliation goals, ESG among them. Progress. As Indigenous business grows, and with Indigenous peoples being the youngest and fastest growing demographic in Canada, the purchasing and investment power of Indigenous people is increasing. The outlook is positive, but there remains significant work to do. Which leads to the second question. What is needed? And I'm so glad you all asked. I recently had the opportunity to attend the North American Leaders Summit in Mexico. Business leaders from Canada, Mexico, and the US gathered to discuss our joint priorities. I looked around the room, and Canada was the only delegation to have Indigenous representation. In fact, we had two. We need more of that. We need to have seats at the tables where decisions are being made. When COVID business supports were first released, many of them did not take into account the specific needs and conditions of Indigenous businesses, resulting in them being excluded. We worked hard, and thanks to having the ear of champions here in Ottawa, changes were made to ensure the supports could reach Indigenous business. We need more of that. But more importantly, we need to be at the table and in the minds of policymakers when those pr programs are being designed not to fix them afterwards. And we need Indigenous businesses to be considered and included in programs developed by ministries across government, not only Indigenous Services Canada. In Canada today, we have a women entrepreneurship strategy, a black entrepreneurship strategy. We need an Indigenous entrepreneurship strategy. While many ministries, Natalie's included, support Indigenous business and Indigenous economic opportunities, very often we are still sent to Indigenous Services Canada with our questions. Unfortunately, today's budget was no different. All but one reference to Indigenous businesses are in Chapter 4, the chapter around reconciliation. While the section in Chapter 4 is titled Self-Determination and Prosperity for Indigenous Prosperity, 76 million of the 111 million committed in 2023 is continued support for administrative capacity of First Nation government and tribal councils delivering critical programs to communities. The remaining 35 million is largely for development of policies and engagement. In total, less than 1% of the new funding in 2023 is earmarked for self-determination and prosperity for Indigenous people. A government-wide strategy to build Indigenous economic prosperity is needed to ensure that this is a priority across government and that we are not satisfied with funding that only satisfies our basic human rights. The same is needed in every corporation, a corporation-wide strategy, like the reconciliation action plans you heard about, to ensure that your organization is going to work with us to achieve Indigenous economic prosperity not just in your Indigenous relations team, but in procurement, in HR, in comms and marketing, 
across the organization and at the board level. The last and perhaps most important question I often hear is, what can I do? Last year, I had the opportunity to share the pen with national Indigenous leaders in developing a national Indigenous economic strategy. The strategy document and the 107 calls to economic prosperity provides a blueprint to achieve meaningful engagement and inclusion of Indigenous peoples in Canada. Within the strategy, there are calls for government, corporations, investors, institutions, and all Canadians. I invite you to read it and choose just one. Critical decisions need to be made to rebuild a sustainable economy, and every decision must include Indigenous people. Each of you in this room and at home has a sphere of influence. You have power in your wallet, in your purchasing options at work, and if you have an option, choose an Indigenous business. In the conversations you have at home, educate yourself and your family on our true history. In the questions you ask in the office, consider the impact and the opportunity of Indigenous inclusion. And when you have the opportunity to invite someone to the table, invite us. We all stand to benefit by supporting, partnering with, procuring from, and investing in Indigenous communities, businesses, and people. When Indigenous people do well economically, Canada does well. And the time is now. Thank you. Miigwech. Good evening. I'm Peter Williams. I'm from Alberta, <clears throat> and I'm one of the founding directors of the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, and I'm also uh, the original chair uh, of the Investment Committee. I'm going to refer to the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation as the IOC, AIOC, so please uh, forgive me for that acronym. Before explaining what the AIOC is all about, Indulge me just for a moment to imagine a reconciliation program, a kind of dream-like reconciliation plan that is government-enabled, but First Nations and industry-led, that in a short period of time could catalyze four separate business partnerships that would generate an estimated $1.2 billion of income over the next 30 years that's predictable, steady, and secure for 27 Indigenous communities and their 61,000 members. Also imagine with me that that 1.2 million is generated from stable businesses, on commercial terms, from deals negotiated not by government, but by, between First Nations and private and public industry. And finally, that the cost to the taxpayer is negligible. And I make this point because it's important. The fact that the cost to the taxpayer is negligible means that this dreamed up reconciliation program I'm asking you to imagine transcends all ideologies and potential leanings. The NDP will love it, and they do. The Liberals love it, and they do. And the conservatives who thought it up love it too. That, in a nutshell, is the AIOC program to date, with a basket of material reconciliation projects yet to come. This program is elegant, it's repeatable, and it empowers First Nations and industry alliances on terms established by them. Again, not by the government with the result that, that First Nations have a credible platform around which they can become full partners and participate in the bounty of our rich nation. It sounds, uh, if I sound like a cheerleader, <laughs> I am. Uh, I genuinely believe in the framework of this program. I have been immense in it for over four years now, and I've seen with, with my own eyes what it is capable of. Full disclosure, though, my wife tells me I'm an, enthusi an enthusiast at heart, so bear that in mind and weigh it in the balance. 
Um, in my opinion, this program turns the inaction and never-ending talk about economic reconciliation into action or reconciliation. And our sincere hope is that each province and the federal government will embrace what started out as an AIOC aspiration. That is now a tried and true model for economic reconciliation. With adoption across Canada, I estimate the model can and will amplify the current economic reconciliation by factors of 10, 20, or 30 times what's been accomplished thus far. So let me just back up just a little bit for, for context. Three years ago, the Alberta government formally set up the AIOC, and we had been working, a team of us had been working on it prior to its setup, drafting the mandates and the, the whole framework. With a mandate to enable First Nations to access capital for Indigenous led investments in natural resources, agriculture, transportation, telecommunications, and related infrastructure. The idea was powerful. It recognized that the missing piece in Indigenous participation was access to capital. No capital, no participation. This program created a bridge to capital, not by lending it, but by offering government guarantees to commercial banks to fund the First Nations equity investments, all on commercial terms and very low risk. Earlier I mentioned the importance of the cost to the taxpayer being negligible as critical. I now emphasize that so too is the low risk element critical. Programs like this only survive as long as there are no train wrecks. A failure or two run the risk of relegating the model to just another failed government program. And even more importantly, low risk means First Nations can rely on the income. They can count on it, knowing that with certainty that it will be there for the next 30 or more years. When we started out at the AIOC, we weren't exactly sure how it would all unfold. Um, with each transaction, there were learnings and what our role would be, what the role of First Nations would be, and what the role of industry would be. Gradually, it took shape. Now we have, a one, we have wonderful precedents that have been spoken to in terms of the Enbridge deal as a, as a really good example. Um, but we have these models, and we've taken the fear out of the concept. And there was so much fear at the outset. Structures set up thus far have had universal buy-in from First Nations, Métis communities and settlements, and no large part because they've been integral in setting those frameworks up themselves. Corporate Canada now has precedent transactions that they can refer to that have been mentioned that they love a precedent. And the banks and the bond markets have confidence as well and are anxious to participate. The only laggard in the whole process have been other governments in our great country. But they are waking up to the possibilities as set by, by this institution. It is said that the secret of getting ahead is getting started. I believe that what the AIOC has started will be and already has been a major catalyst to economic reconciliation getting ahead and getting ahead with the scale and impact that economic reconciliation requires and aspires to. Thank you. Greetings to everyone in attendance today and joining us online across Turtle Island. It gives me great pleasure to be here addressing you today on the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe, Algonquin Nation. My name is Charlene Gale. I'm Chief of the Fort Nelson First Nation and Chair of the First Nation Major Projects Coalition. For those who are not familiar with our organization, the First Nation Major Projects Coalition was founded by 11 First Nations and has since grown to include 130 First Nations in seven provinces and territories. 
We are currently overseeing a project portfolio worth over $40 billion, all of which involves equity positions for First Nation partners. The focus on First Nation equity positions and economic reconciliation is a crucial reason why we're here gathered today. Oil and gas pipelines have been running through my traditional territory for almost a century. My First Nation members were never consulted about whether we wanted them built. And we were certainly not given the opportunity to share in the profits. We have not only lived with the environmental impacts of countless projects that we never consented to, but Canada's wealth and global standing were built from it and upon our Indigenous lands with little to none of that wealth benefiting First Nations. The money industry made on my nation's territory have flowed out of our territory through oil and gas pipelines. Unfortunately, First Nations across Canada have not received much, if any, economic benefit from infrastructure projects such as these. While there has been employment opportunities over the years, such as my time working at the Fort Nelson gas plant, it is no longer acceptable for First Nations to miss out on benefits of projects on their lands, and the Canadian courts are agreeing with us. The recent legal decision made clear, and I quote, these are BC's own words, that the province must improve its assessment and management of cumulative impacts of industrial development on the Blueberry River First Nation treaty rights and to ensure these constitutional rights are protected. That Treaty 8 land use decision in our treaty area has set a new precedence for treaty rights across the country. Proponents such as Enbridge need to respect our jurisdiction in our territories, which is what our elders and our members have always said. From my experience, with Enbridge operating in the Fort Nelson First Nation Territory, their company has stranded a newly built gas plant that never saw a speck of gas due to the market bust. This has had a significant impact on our lands, and our First Nation certainly isn't happy about them clearing 100 hectares just to create an eyesore in a territory that wasn't needed. Along with the promises of many jobs that would, it, would, it would create for our people, it was the same old boom and bust. However, during COP27 in Egypt, I had the opportunity to raise these concerns directly with an Enbridge executive and describe the impacts that it has had on our territory. But it is clear for me from that conversation and other recent examples that Enbridge is on a journey. In my perspective, Enbridge seems to be learning from its past mistakes. Enbridge made the news recently from striking a deal with 23 First Nations and Métis communities with 11.57% interest in seven Enbridge pipelines. I can proudly say that two of those First Nation members are part of the First Nation Major Projects Coalition. From a First Nation perspective, there's definitely a concession involved here. As First Nations, we know these pipelines, in many cases, are gonna go through our lands anyways and we should be at the very least benefiting from them, including the ones that we didn't originally consent to. But Enbridge and other companies of its kind are starting to understand what Indigenous economic reconciliation means in practical terms. These companies know that major projects on Indigenous land, which is all of Canada, they must meet, an, they must meet the new bar that has been set. And that bar is that First Nations must have the option for equity ownership of proposed projects on their lands. What I say is, what better measure of First Nation consent is there than First Nations owning the project? I see equity sharing as righting this historical wrong. First Nation equity ownership and access to competitive capital of project financing are a first step in economic reconciliation. First Nations live in different locations across Turtle Island and often have slim choices in what economic development options are available to them. So supporting this economic reconciliation means that the Government of Canada must further invest in Indigenous capacity to action-inform decision-making 
and accelerate project development while prioritizing free prior and informed consent. Implement a national Indigenous loan guarantee program to support options for Indigenous business partnerships. Look to Indigenous nations to find efficiency in Canada's project regulatory and permitting processes and provide support to First Nations who will require training, education and other supports to benefit from the new clean energy opportunities. First Nations are on the front lines of these impacts and these projects and we want to be partners in them. My First Nation has taken its own initiative to start the transition to clean decarbonizing carbonizing our grid through a clean energy generating to deca geothermal power plant, 100% Indigenous owned by my First Nation. The last 100 years have been an unbroken period of economic exclusion for First Nations in Canada. And we all must work together to ensure the next 100 years are built on econ economic inclusion and shared prosperity. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for, for being here tonight and Masi Cho, hi hi, thank you. Thank you, Justin Burke, Dr. Monica Gavinger, Natalie Kaufelt, Trevor Gardner, Tabitha Bull, Peter Williams, and Chief Charlene Gale. And as Tabitha Bull said, if you have an option to choose an indigenous business, do so. Now I'm going to invite our talkers to stand up and head out to the reception and if the rest of you could just stay here, give them a head start, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the walrus and what we have coming up. If you enjoy tonight's talks, we have more. On Tuesday, April 4th, we're hosting the Walrus Talks at Home Indigenous Health. This is presented by Johnson & Johnson, and you can join us online from across the country and beyond. Then on Wednesday, April 26th, the Walrus will be in Toronto for the Walrus Talks in New City with Concordia University. And on May 11th, we'll be back here at the National Gallery of Canada for the Walrus Talks, What's Happening Now, also with Concordia University. We encourage you to sign up for our newsletter. If you're here in Ottawa, you can do that on your way out at a table we have set up with members of the Walrus team. And we'll be in touch with everyone with a follow-up email so you can opt in to stay in touch with us. We also encourage you to subscribe to the Walrus we have a special offer for tonight's attendees, just for you, a full year subscription to The Walrus. That's eight issues delivered right to your door for just $25. Visit the Walrus table outside and we'll get you signed up. For 20 years now, The Walrus has been home to Canada's conversation. And in this increasingly complex world of shrinking newsrooms and encroaching media conglomerates, our work is more important than ever. And we're able to do this work thanks to our community of support. Help us secure our future and consider supporting independent media and fact-based journalism with a donation. You can donate online at thewalrus.ca, just click on donate, or this special table I keep telling you about for those of you in Ottawa. All gifts of $20 or more do receive a charitable tax receipt. Thanks again to our partners at Enbridge for making this conversation possible. Thanks to our talkers, to our annual sponsors you see behind me, Air Canada, Inspire, and Shaw. And thank you all for attending and being a part of this conversation and in the walrus community with us. Have a great evening. <laughs>